As we continue in our series, Be Great. The reality is the fullness of joy, and the fullness of the essence that God has endowed you with or created you with is expressed and experienced in serving the Lord. Jesus said that the greatest of all must be the what? Servant of all. And so it's so important that we understand our call to serve the Lord. And the reason you ought to serve the Lord is you ought to put first things first. If he delivered you, you ought to serve him. If he lifted you, you ought to serve him. If he picked you up, turned you around, placed your feet on solid ground, you ought to serve him. And then as you look at what you have, I know that in your hands it may seem ordinary, but God is able to do extraordinary things when we surrender what's in our hands to God's hands. And that's why you're able to do and you have more than what you think. If this is your first time hearing any of those, you need to go back on YouTube and watch the replay of all of the sermons in this series. <laughs> you play hooky <laughs> online and in person. And all of those were the sermon titles of the sermons that have been in this series. And in order to have context for where we are, it's important that you listen to those messages as well. I want to direct our attention to Matthew chapter 9, 35 through 38. You'll find these words. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, and send to send out laborers into his harvest. Verse 37 and 38, one more time. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. The title of this sermon comes from a subject that you haven't heard anything about here recently. And I just want to preach, be great, worker shortage. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Worker shortage. I know all of us have heard that term, that subject, that topic here recently, whether it be in the news, in conversation. The reality is we have a serious worker shortage. Perhaps you've been in conversation with a business owner in the community or you've talked to small business owners and many of them talked about their challenge, and that is this. We couldn't find any workers. We couldn't find anyone to work. There's a place that I go quite regularly and frequent and pick up food, and the manager said to me, do you know anybody who is looking for a job? Because we're struggling to find workers. If you haven't heard this on the news, if you haven't heard anyone say this, I still submit that you are keenly and personally acquainted with this worker shortage. 
because our lives as consumers have been altered and adjusted and impacted by the worker shortage. Have you tried to catch a flight here recently? Lord have mercy. You know that flights are being canceled left and right. And airlines are paying thousands of dollars to customers who will willingly give up their seats. And this is due to the worker shortage. Have you had to wait in line a little bit longer than normal recently? <laughs> Most of the time when that took place, the managers or the owners would be very apologetic and they would come and say how sorry they were that it took so long, but not so anymore. <laughs> They'll opine, you need to just be a little patient because we have a worker shortage. We're trying the best that we can. I, in my own community, I saw them build a Taco Bell. They put it up. It looks nice and pretty, has the signature signage and everything, but for some reason it hadn't opened. And somebody said to me, the reason they haven't opened that Taco Bell is that they built the building, but they can't find anybody to work in it. We have a worker shortage. If that's not your experience, all of us have ordered something here recently. <laughs> and they told you that it would arrive at your door at a certain time. But then you looked and it did not arrive on time. It was delayed. And the reason for that is because there is a worker shortage. Don't get sick and have to go to the ER now. You already had to wait a long time generally in the ER, but now your wait is much longer. And the reason is because in some of our most critical industries, like healthcare and emergency response, there is a worker shortage. The New York Times published an article with this title, Nursing in Crisis. Staff shortages put patients at risk. The opening line of that article was a quote by an expert, and he simply said, when hospitals are understaffed, people die. Some have opined that the public is also at risk because of a shortage of police officers, which means that the, their ability to respond to the emergencies that we may have when we call 911 is compromised. So whether it be long lines, longer waits, delayed shipping, businesses in your area that don't open or businesses that were there for a long time that have now closed, whether it be long waits related to emergency response or health care, all of our lives have been impacted by this worker shortage yet i would submit to us my brothers and sisters that what is happening in our world right now what we are keenly aware of around us right now because of an altered experience related to being a consumer i would submit to us that this has historically been a challenge in the kingdom and in the local church. Yeah, that's right, that's right. That, that this worker shortage has historically been a challenge in the kingdom and therefore in the local church. What I find quite interesting is that with all of the conversations that I've had with pastors across the nation and across the globe, what I think is very interesting is that not one conversation that I've had with a pastor, have I ever heard the pastor say that our problem is that we have too many volunteers or workers. 
Not one time, not, not, not one time. Quite to the contrary, there is a concern about a worker shortage or not having enough hands for the kingdom work that is before them, that there is great opportunity, but we don't have enough hands to take advantage of it. There are pastors all across the nation that are talking about their struggles with a worker shortage. But very rarely are people being turned away from serving. But rather there is this earnest push and earnest effort that is being made to recruit more workers. Strategies are being drafted. Conferences are in conferences. People are discussing how to increase volunteers and create an infectious culture in the local church for workers, for people who will serve the Lord using their gifts and their abilities in the kingdom. This worker shortage, however, continues to abound. And what is even more problematic that the church really needs to be paying attention to right now as the alarm is being sounded is that this worker shortage is not just connected to volunteers serving in the church. But the alarm is being sounded right now that there is a struggle and there is a deficiency in the pipeline for Christian leadership, that there is a crisis right now as pastors are leaving ministry, redefining what their ministry looks like, and there are less trained Christian leaders, and as a result, it is making it hard to fill vacancies with competent and strong leadership, that this pandemic has exacerbated a very serious reality, and that is that local pastors are burnt out, they are leaving ministry, and churches are struggling to replace them. That, 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 that the church in America, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, this year said they have over 600 vacant pastoral positions. And the alarm is being sounded that this is a major crisis and we are feeling the tremors. But if we ignore the alarm, if we ignore the tremors, eventually we will see and experience the quake of not having leaders to lead God's church. The reality is, as I consider this worker shortage, I have to say, I despise long lines. I don't like to wait long. I despise businesses closing and not opening, delayed shipping. I can't stand it. Oh, God, help us when flights are canceled. I can't stand any of that. But can I say the consequences of a worker shortage in industry and business pales in comparison to the consequences of a worker shortage in the kingdom of God. Are y'all with me in here? That, that, that the consequences that we experience as consumers, as a result of a worker shortage, or business owners, as a result of a worker shortage, that pales in comparison to the consequences that we experience in the kingdom and in the church as a result of a worker shortage. If I can put it like this, delayed shipping is nothing in comparison to delayed delivery from Satan's bondage and attacks when you are bound and trying to be set free. That's right. Businesses closing is nothing in comparison to eyes closing in time on this side and not being prepared for eternity on the other side. That flights being canceled is nothing in comparison to people being grounded in their lives and stuck where they are because of a 
addiction or low self-esteem or insecurity and toxic behavior and toxic thoughts. The consequences due to a worker shortage in the kingdom are much more dire than anything we can experience in this world as a result of a worker shortage. Can you imagine with me for a moment with all that is happening in the world? Imagine with me for a moment a world without a place called sanctuary. Imagine a community without the church of the living God where the gospel is being proclaimed and people are gathering to worship and live in the truth of the gospel. Can you imagine with me for a moment a world with all that is going on and there is no place of refuge called sanctuary where you can go? That's a nightmare. The consequences of this worker shortage in the kingdom and in the church is far more dire. Which means we need to pay attention to this worker shortage and this serious reality. And in this time, where we are keenly aware and acquainted with the consequences of a worker shortage, Pastor Akin Binyu comes before you, lifting up the words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Through these words, we discover that the crisis of a worker shortage is not new in the kingdom of God. That even as Jesus was on the earth, even as he was walking the earth and ministering, Jesus was sounding the alarm of a worker shortage. He says the harvest is plentiful, but there are a shortage of hands to reap it, that the work abounds, but there is a scarcity of workers to do it. Jesus was shouting that the harvest is great, that we are in a ripe season but there aren't enough reapers to bring it in. Jesus is ultimately saying that we have a worker shortage. The mission still stands, but there's a shortage of missionaries. The ministry is still effective, but there's a shortage of ministers. The opportunity still abounds but they're not enough hands to seize it. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. But as I re-examined this text and prayed through it and looked at it again, upon closer examination, I don't believe there was ever a time in the New Testament where this worker shortage was rectified. I don't believe there was ever a time in the New Testament where laborers were turned away because they had more workers than they had work. I, I can't read through Acts and ever find a time where it seemed like the reapers were greater than the harvest. No, no, the, the reality is, as I look at the New Testament, this scarcity of laborers abounds. And that brings me to the thesis of this message, which is what God gave me, which I want to share to you. And that is this, the demand for faithful work always exceeds the supply of faithful workers. Which means that if you ever are in a position where you say, there is no room for me. There is no room for my gift. They already have enough people. I want you to look at the devil and say, that is a lie. That is not true. There is always room for more laborers because the demand will always exceed the supply. Right. Why is this? Because there's always a great demand 
for faithful ministry. I want us to understand that these words spoken by Jesus are spoken in the context of Matthew summarily giving a description of Jesus' ministry. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. But lest you think this is some novel description, it's not new. Because if you read Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, we find the same description. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. This is Matthew's description of Jesus' ministry. So if you want to know what Jesus did in ministry, Matthew says he taught, he preached, and he healed. He taught, he preached, and he healed those who were hurting. Here it is. Jesus taught the good news, and he cared for those who were hurting and afflicted so that they could experience and live into God's good for their lives. This right here, it encapsulates the focus and the ministry of Jesus. Jesus taught what God wanted, but he didn't just teach what God wanted, but he cared for those that he taught enough to minister to them and to care for them so that they could actually do what God wanted. He taught them what God wanted them to have and how God wanted them to live, but he did not just teach them. He also ministered to them and cared for them enough to provide some of the needs that they had so that they could experience God's goodness in their lives. He taught and he cared. It, it, is, it, is, it is teaching what God desires. But it's not just teaching what God desires, but it's also ministering so that people can be empowered and equipped to walk in and live in and experience God's desires. Which means then, my brothers and sisters, that if this is what the ministry of Jesus was about, then you and I, called to be missionaries, called to be disciples, called to do God's work, if this is what the ministry of Jesus was about, teaching and preaching and caring and healing, then that means that faithful ministry in our times must be about teaching and preaching and caring for God's people and the world. God does not want the church just to talk about what is right, but God wants wants the church to do what is right. That's right. God doesn't just want the church to tell people who they are, but God wants to equip them so that they can actually live out who they are. God doesn't just want the church to teach that we are victorious. God wants us to equip people so that they can actually live in the victory that God has already given them. God doesn't just want us to talk about holiness, but God wants us to walk with people and disciple them so that they can live in a holy way. God wants us to teach and to minister. It's, 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 it's teaching about the healing virtue of Jesus, but then also ministering so that people have good health care. It's, it's, it's teaching about God's justice. But then it's also ministering to actively pursue justice and to dismantle inequitable systems in the world that keep people from experiencing God's goodness in their lives. It's teaching about stewardship and also showing love and mercy to those who are sinking in the quicksand of life. Hallelujah. It is not being the Levite who knew all of the right doctrine but then walked past the, the man on the side of the road that had been beaten 
up by robbers, but it's having the right doctrine and teaching it and also caring for people so that they can be lifted up from the despairing realities of their lives. This is faithful ministry. And this is why you and I have to be equipped with right doctrine if you're going to teach. And you also have to be empowered to minister if you're going to care. The question that I have for you is who are you teaching? And who are you caring for? This is the ministry of Jesus encapsulated in Matthew. Matthew says he taught, he preached, and he healed, which means that we are called to do the same, which is why there will always be a demand for ministry. You know why? Because if we're called to heal and to care, there will always be hurting people in the world. If we're called to teach, there will always be people who do not know their left from their right, as it was said about the people in Nineveh. This is why there will always be a demand for ministry, because ministry includes those who are hurting. It includes ministering to those who are beleaguered and afflicted and sick and broken in this world. And it's right here in our text, because the Bible says when Jesus saw the crowd, He had compassion on them. Here it is, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The image behind the word harassed here is literally, it is is to be torn apart, tooth and nail. It means to be dejected. It means to be bothered. It means to be troubled or worried. And I just want you to know that there are a lot of people right around you every day that feel torn apart tooth and nail. They may never tell you. They may not look the part. But can I tell you, there are people in your business meetings every day that are torn apart tooth and nail. There are people right inside your home that are torn apart tooth and nail. There are people in your community that you come across every day that are torn apart tooth and nail. There are people around you that are harassed every single day. Not not only does he say harassed, but he also says they're helpless. Here it is. They're broken people, but what makes their situation even more of a crisis is that this word helpless, it, it literally means to basically be thrown away. It means to be discarded and propelled with force. Because here's what happens, the world will beat you down and then throw you out. I wish I had some witnesses. The world will beat you down and then throw you out and tell you that your life is not valuable and your life is not worth anything. As a matter of fact, this word is used in the Septuagint to talk about dead corpses being thrown into tombs. And there are many people who are walking around. They are the walking and talking dead because they have breath in their bodies, but they are dead in their spirit and dead in their soul and dead in their hearts. And Jesus says, They are harassed and they've been thrown away. They are helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Images of an animal laying in his own blood and nobody picks him up. Nobody there to care for him. Can I tell you, there are people in our world who are harassed and helpless and they need a guide. And they're looking for a guy. There are people who are harassed and helpless in their world. And they're looking for somebody who says you are more than your mistakes. They're, they're, they're looking for somebody to protect and to care and to guide. And they are dejected. They are feel thrown apart. They feel thrown down. They feel left for dead. And they need a shepherd to guide them. Maybe this is why. 
If the crowds are helpless and harassed, maybe this is why Matthew is emphatic about the fact that the crowds come chasing after Jesus. Matthew, 49 times in his gospel, he talks about the crowds. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 4, 25, it says, Great crowds followed him from Galilee and the disciples from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and taught. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 says, When he came down, great crowds followed him when he came down the mountain. And you can't get more emphatic than this. In Matthew Matthew chapter 15, verse 30, it says, And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and they put them at his feet, and he healed them. Do you see it, my brothers and sisters? The crowds are harassed and helpless. The crowds are broken and knocked down. The crowds are broken and left for dead. But here it is. They need an answer to their pain, and they need a solution to their problem, and they find in Jesus an answer. They find in Jesus a solution to the problems that they have. And what I like about Jesus is he does not get angry and see the crowd as a hindrance. He doesn't get angry and bothered at the crowd and see them as a nuisance. He doesn't get angry at the crowd and say, I have better things to do. No, the Bible says he had compassion on the crowd. That, that word compassion, it is literally to be moved on the inside by the plight that you see on the outside. Here it is. It, it, it is literally a visceral, physical response to the pain that you see. It, it's like us saying, my heart was moved. It's like being arrested at somebody's pants saying, I can't walk past it. I got to do something about it. And this, honestly, is the impetus for many of the miracles that Jesus performed. Because Jesus sees people in crisis and has compassion on them. But thanks be unto God, he doesn't just see them in crisis and have compassion on them. He also has the power to change the crisis and to change the circumstances in their lives. You remember when he was in front of the 5,000? The Bible says he looked at the crowd and he had what? Compassion on them. He felt their hunger. He felt their pain. And as a result, he multiplies the two fish and the five loaves of bread and the Bible says he feeds them Jesus moves with compassion and he performs miracles because he has compassion on the crowd that is broken can I say to us that we have been placed in God's church we have been called out by God to have the mind and the compassion of Christ to recognize that Christ is still relevant them for crowds that are broken because you've got crowds around you that need the gospel of Jesus. you got crowds of people that you talk to every day that are looking for an answer, that are looking for a solution. And instead of seeing them as a hindrance, instead of seeing them as a problem, instead of seeing the issue as a problem, you need to say they are looking for an answer. And thanks be unto God, I know who the answer is. I wish I had some witnesses. Do you know that you're called to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ? Do you know that you're called to lift up the name of Jesus with everything that you have so that people can recognize that if you're broken, he can mend you. If you're confused, he can give you clarity. If you're out, he can bring you in. If you're down, he can lift you up. If you're sick, he can heal you. If you need healing, he can do it. If you need provision, he can provide it. Is there anybody here that knows that Jesus has called you to be an ambassador for him. Just this week, I was having a conversation about a police officer in Cary, Cary, North Carolina. Nice area. And uh, he quit. He said, I can't take this anymore. And so he said, I couldn't, I couldn't be on the police force anymore. It was too much. And the issue was not all of the social 
and political climate that's connected to that particular profession right now. The issue was that out of the 25 calls that he had to respond to, 22 of them were suicides. Are y'all with me in here? Um, 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 22 out of 25 calls were suicides. Uh, 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 don't, don't rush past this, that, that there are people who live in the suburbs, but yet when they look at themselves in the mirror, they don't see fearfully and wonderfully made. There are people who've got good paying jobs. And they have good money, but they still are broken in their spirit and in their heart and don't believe that their life is worth keeping. They don't believe that there is hope for tomorrow. They don't believe that tomorrow is filled with good despite what is happening today. And as a result, they believe that it is better to leave the earth rather than to stay and trust that God is going to bring you out. Can I tell you, with our sanctified and holy selves, while we are in church, if you know the goodness of the Lord, if you know the faithfulness of God, if you know the mercy of God, if you know the kindness of God, if you know what God has done, you ought to recognize that God has called you to be about the work of ministry to let people know that no matter how great your problem may be, there is one who has a solution. And no matter how great the mountain may be, there is one who weighs the mountain in his Hand. that no matter how great the gulf of the sea may be in front of you, we serve a God who is able to part seas and to make ways in the wilderness and to deliver you. This is why there is always going to be a great demand for ministry. But here's what I like about Jesus. There's always this great demand for faithful ministry, but he doesn't just focus on the problem. Jesus also sees the potential for people to enter the kingdom. Notice the Bible says Jesus sees them. He sees their hurt. He sees their pain. He sees their struggles. But when he speaks to his disciples, he indicates that in this, he sees harvest. Uh, he says they're harassed and they're helpless. But when he speaks to his disciples, he says the harvest is plentiful. Uh, can, can I tell you why this blesses me? Because it says Jesus doesn't just see problems. He doesn't just see a plight. He sees in the problem potential for them to be brought into the kingdom. Are y'all with me in here? He, he sees that pain is an opportunity for them to be ministered to and introduced to the God that heals, which is why he can say the harvest is plentiful and perhaps we need more disciples who have the mind of Christ that look and say, I see in the heartbreak and I see in the headaches the harvest that God has placed before us, that King Kingdom opportunity often comes in the most inopportune times. That's right. That kingdom opportunity comes in the most difficult seasons. Can I tell you why? Because sometimes it is not delight that brings prodigals home. Often it is pain and affliction that brings prodigals home. Oh, where my Bible readers, the prodigal son, he didn't turn around and come back to God because he said, I'm blessed so much. It was when that boy hit a rock bottom and when he hit the rock that he said you know what I came to myself and said it's better that I come to my father's house. Can I tell you sometimes God will allow hard times and hard seasons to prime the hearts of people to recognize that home is where God is. That home is in his presence. That home is next to him which means that we need disciples who see with the mind of God. Uh, what, what do you see 
when you look at the crown. Here's the major issue. Here's the major problem. That so oftentimes we're supposed to have the compassion of Christ when we look at the crown. But instead of having the compassion of Christ, we sit in a seat of condemnation. Instead of sharing Jesus, we sit in a seat of judgment. Instead of seeing potential, we focus solely on the problem. And dare I say that our service to God is impacted directly by what we see in the crowd. If we simply critique, we'll never focus on introducing them to the love of Christ. But if we have the mind of Christ, we will see harvest in hardship. Oh, hallelujah. This is blessing me. Can I tell you, you've got harvest in your family right now. That's right. You've got people in your family who are far off from God and they don't know their left from their right either. And they are doing everything that they are big and bad enough to do. But the people of faith, they see it and they say, I see harvest. Hallelujah. I see potential for them to come into the saving knowledge of who Jesus is. And so I'm not just going I'm focus on the problem, but I'm also going to focus on the potential for them to be brought into the kingdom. Which means that the church of the living God is not called to shrink back when things get hard. During times like we're in right now, it would be a mistake for the church of the living God to fall back from mission and ministry and vision because harvest time is found in hard times. And so churches in this season that are becoming more casual and cavalier about church and the faith, you are missing it. Hallelujah. Because now is the opportune time for the people of God to recognize that through the pandemic, God is priming the hearts of people to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be ministered to in a powerful way. We don't fall back. Oh, sometimes we fall back as if God needs our opportune times to do some of his best work. As a matter of fact, I have discovered that in the worst times, that's when God actually does some of his best work. Where are my Bible scholars? You do understand that when Jesus came, it was not during a time of Jewish dominance, but it was a time of Jewish oppression when Rome, the Roman regime was oppressing the Jews. And that's when God sent Jesus. That's when God sent his son to die on a Roman cross to look like he was a criminal on a Roman cross. And God used that ignominious cross to bring about our great salvation. If the church actually saw what God could do with deplorable times and deplorable things, we would have faith in this season and say we're not shrinking back, but we're going after everything that God has placed before us because God has placed opportunity in hard times. Ooh, I feel it in here. There's opportunity before you right now, which is why oftentimes as it relates to harvest, Jesus often has to say to his disciples, open your eyes. You have to tell them to open their eyes because disciples are prone to being right in front of harvest and missing it. Which is why Jesus must say in John 4, 35, do you yet say there are yet three months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, see that the fields are white for harvest. Because you can miss harvest if all you're focusing on are hard times. Jesus says, there's harvest before you right now. The harvest is plentiful. But here it is. The demand will always exceed the supply of faithful workers. The harvest is plentiful. 
the laborers are few. There's an abundance of opportunity, scarcity of workers. The serious threat we face, my brothers and sisters, is not an absent harvest. Uh-uh. I know we sing the songs, my harvest is coming, my harvest is on the way, and we celebrate that. But can I be real with you from scripture? Um, I think that as we are talking about our harvest being on the way, oftentimes talking about personal blessings and promotion and all of that, I think Jesus would respond to the church, your harvest is already here. You know why? Because in scripture, when you see harvest in the New Testament, oftentimes it is not talking about personal blessings and promotion, all of that personal promotion. It is talking about the opportunity, the ripe season for souls to come into the kingdom. So while you are waiting on harvest, Jesus is saying the harvest is plentiful. Hallelujah. The harvest is right here before you. It's not a scarcity of harvest. The problem is a scarcity of hands to actually reap it. The fruit is already on the vine, but it's not enough faithful laborers in the vineyard. It's not enough faithful people who are willing to put some spiritual sweat equity into reaping what is already before us. Jesus says the laborers are few. And when he says laborers, I don't think he's just talking about those who are in the field. But he's talking about those who are faithful in the field. How do I know? Because there wasn't a shortage of Pharisees and Sadducees during this time. There weren't a shortage of religious leaders during this time. There weren't a shortage of religious groups and religious sects during this time. The high priesthood wasn't vacant. Somebody was occupying it. So Jesus was not talking about titles and folk in the temple and in the former religious community. Jesus was talking about faithful laborers who will labor with a keen recognition that the field that I've been placed in doesn't belong to me. That the field belongs to God and as a faithful worker that has been placed in the field, I want to work in a way that honors the owner of the field. Who am I talking to? See, we got a whole lot of people that are in the church but don't serve in a way with a king recognition that the church doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to the owner, which means that I want to serve in a way that honors Jesus and honors God and glorifies the name of the Lord. I want to serve in a way that glorifies him. Amen. Jesus says the, the laborers are few. Um, th those who will serve in a way that exemplifies a keen awareness that this is God's field. We, we need, we need, we need faithful laborers. We need faithful workers. If I can give it to you just the way Spirit gave it to me, I heard the Lord say, uh, I, I don't need more titles, I need more laborers. I, I, I don't need more complainers, I need more laborers. I, I don't need more troublemakers, I need more laborers. I don't need more super sanctified holy earth than thou saints who can condemn everything but never put their hand to anything to try to rectify what they are condemning. I need more laborers. I, 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 I need more laborers. Can I tell you why? Because there are dire consequences to a labor shortage. Now here's what gets me, Reverend Pridgen. So I was reading this passage, I'm thinking through it. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, and he speaks this when he's on the scene. The greatest laborer to ever labor is on the scene. 
the laborer who has a greater capacity than any laborer ever had is on the scene. He's on the scene, yet he says, we don't have enough laborers. Because Jesus recognizes that if the opportunity is going to be reaped and seized that is before us, here it is, Jesus even says, I can't do it by myself. Are y'all with me in here? This is why right after this passage, Jesus will send out the 12. This is why he called the disciples, because Jesus recognized that because of the abundance of opportunity, I can't be a lone ranger trying to do it by myself, but I need as many hands as possible to put your hand to the plow to help us to reap what God God has before us. And can I say, if Jesus recognized that he couldn't do it alone, then certainly we ought to recognize that we can't do it alone as well. And every member of this church ought to recognize that the church and the opportunity is bigger than the pastor. It is bigger than the deacons. It is bigger than the trustees. It is bigger than those who are already serving. It requires everybody to put your hand to the plow and serve in God's feet to help us to reap the harvest that is before us. Which means that I believe that one of the things that God has to be troubled by is when there are a few laborers trying to cover a large portion of the field and there are other laborers who are sitting and enjoying the benefits of being in the field but not putting their hand to help reap in it. Are y'all with me in here? And the reason is because those laborers then get burned out. And burnout is a serious reality in the church. From the leader on down, burnout is a serious reality. And it happens because the harvest is plentiful, but the labor is a few. And here is Jesus' solution. He says there's always room for more workers. But here's Jesus' solution, which, which for me, it startles me a little bit. Dr. Scott, it startles me because I would think that if the harvest is plentiful and you don't have enough laborers, that Jesus would say, y'all go and set up that ministry fair. Y'all go and try to recruit as many people as possible. Go to your cousins, go to your aunts, go to your houses, bring them back. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus says, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. He doesn't tell them to go and pull folk to get them and bring them. He says, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Here it is, my brothers and sisters. I believe that in our church, we need more prayer warriors, hallelujah, who see a need and before you become hyperactive and just doing, 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 you need to pray, hallelujah, to the Lord of the harvest because you understand it's God's field and God takes responsibility for it and God will also be the one who sends laborers into the vineyard. We need more prayer warriors who understand Stands, that God still answers prayer, that God is still listening, that God is still moving, and God is still hearing and answering the prayers that we pray. Do I have anybody here who says, I'm going to pray about it? That's right. I'm going to pray about the ministry going. I'm going to pray about provision being given. I'm going to pray about laborers being sent. I'm going to pray about gifts being exposed. I'm going to pray about people serving. I'm going to pray for conviction for those who are not doing it. I'm going to pray that God will convict so that they will become a laborer that helps us to reap the harvest that is before us. Do I have any prayer warriors <laughs> who will pray to the Lord of the harvest? The problem is that in our day and age, we're taught that prayer is the last thing that you should do when everything else doesn't work. When in fact, 
Prayer is the first thing you should do or everything else is not going to work. You ought to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Can I tell you why? Can I tell you why? Because if you select, you might select someone who does not have the heart for the Lord of the harvest. And so in your selecting, you still are selecting people and you got somebody, but not a person who's actually going to serve in a way that glorifies and honors God. Ooh, hallelujah. And this blesses me because I think it applies in so many different things. This ought to be your prayer to God. I don't want what I select. I want what you send. Ooh. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. I don't want what I select. I want who you send. Because many of us, would you stand? Many of us are in the rut that we are in right now. Because if the truth be told, we're doing the selecting and not patiently waiting on God to do the sending. And there are a whole lot of folk who we have selected to be in God's field and God said, I didn't send them. You got a whole lot of friends, a whole lot of relationships, a whole lot of things. You, did, you selected, God didn't send. And you need to wait on God to send, which is why if I've got to stay in a posture where I'm praying, I'm trusting that because it's God's field, God is going to provide what I need and who I need to reap the opportunity that is before me. God says the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the vineyard, into his harvest. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to see great opportunity and to wait on God to send the laborers. But how many of you know, oh, hallelujah, I feel this in my spirit. God will send if you patiently wait on him. Ha oh, hallelujah. God will send. If you patiently wait on him, God will sin. And maybe right now, God is sending already because he's pricking your spirit and pricking your heart and speaking to you of opportunities that are present right now. And you know you have the gifts. You know you have the abilities. You know you have the skills. You know you have the time, the talent, and the treasure. And God is saying, I'm sending you. Be open to the voice of God because the reality is there is always more work than workers. And so if you ever hear, you know, I think there's no room. I'm good. They're good. That's not true. There's always more work than workers. There's always room for what God has given you. And if you are in the field and serving, can I tell you, I know Reaping and working in God's harvest, that's hard. It's not easy. Which is why you ought to be praying. Because sometimes you got to go all by yourself. 
and you got to do and nobody else will. But while you're doing praying, 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 Lord, send laborers into the harvest. Sometimes you got to do 10 times because it seems like after you do five, people still don't get it, but you got to keep on doing it. But that's all right. Keep praying, 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 praying. Send laborers into the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Since it's God's field, God takes responsibility for it. And God will send, God will provide what you need. Some business owner in here right now, you received that vision from God and you say, God, I don't have the hands, I don't have the help that I need. It's a worker shortage. God says, did I give you the vision? Did I give you that direction? And if your answer is yes, God, I know it came from you. God says, just wait on me. I'm going to send some help. Hallelujah. I'm going to send the help that you need. I'm going to send the laborers that you need to help you to reap the harvest. So right now, my brother, my sister, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Right now, It's harvest time. Hallelujah. She, she came even before I made the call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is sending. Hallelujah. 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 It's harvest time. 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 I see the harvest. I feel the harvest. God is speaking to your heart. He's speaking to your spirit right now. And he's saying, now is the time. This is the day. This is the opportunity for you to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the opportunity for you to yield and surrender. This is the opportunity for you to throw up your hands and say, I'm tired of trying to figure it out myself. God, I'm putting my trust in you. If you're here right now, and you want to surrender your life to Jesus. That's the first call. If you're here and that's you, I want you just to raise your hand. Today is the day of a new beginning. Today is the day of a fresh start. You didn't want to be the first one. We thank God for this daughter of Zion who has come already. Hallelujah. And God, hallelujah, is speaking to your heart. He's speaking to your spirit. Saying right now is the time. The second call is this. I'm here, I'm saved, but I do not have a church home. Do not have a place where I'm planted. Do not have a place where I'm growing. I do not have a place where I'm connected. Listen, you need to be connected to a place called church because you need to join with other laborers. You need to be a co- Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, 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 come on. Come on, somebody give him glory. Somebody give him honor. Somebody give him praise. Yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord. I need to be connected to a place called church. And you didn't want to be the first one. Thanks be unto God. These are here and they have come. I would not allow this moment to pass. Hear me, Baptist Grove. The times are drawing nigh. The time, or the time is drawing nigh. Now is not the time, hallelujah, to be out of relationship with God. Now is not the time to be out of connection with a place called church. Now is not the time to be playing games in your faith. Now is the time to yield completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you, I want you just to raise your hand, say, I'm coming. I'll co we'll come right to where you are. Hallelujah. Today is the day of a new beginning. This is the day of a fresh start. This is the day for you to say yes to Jesus. This is the day for you to say yes to his church. If you're online, hallelujah, now is the time for you to say yes to Jesus. Now is the time for you to say yes to his church. Hallelujah. 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 
just before we take our seat, just before we take our seat and we pray over thee, I want you to look at one person beside you. Don't take off your mask. Hallelujah. Don't touch them. Just look at them. Just look at them. Just look at them. Just look at them. And say, do you need to say yes? Do you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ or connect with a place called church? Tell them, don't stay on the fence. Don't come close. Tell them now is the opportunity. Hallelujah. I don't care how hard things may be in your life. Now is the opportunity for you to say yes to Jesus or yes to the place called church. If they say that's me, I want you just to walk with them. Hallelujah. Just walk with them. Just walk with them. You don't have to grab their hand or anything. Just walk with them and say I, hallelujah. They're not leaving today the same way that they came in. Now is the time. This is the day of new beginning. This is the day of a fresh start. This is the day to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to stretch forth your hands to this altar. Ooh, glory. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I am available. Lord, I thank you for breathing on these. Hallelujah. I thank you that it's not their strength, not their power, but God, it's your grace and it's your mercy. I thank you right now, God, for their surrender. I thank you right now for their yes. Whether they're surrendering their lives to you or connecting with this place called church or both, God, I thank you right now, God, that in their yes, Lord, I thank you that there's new beginning. In their yes, Lord, I thank you that there's greater anointing. In their yes, Lord, I thank you that there's greater power. In their yes, Lord, I thank you that there's greater vision. In their yes, Lord, I thank you that there's a harvest. Hallelujah. In their yes, Lord, I thank you right now that walls, hallelujah, are being torn down. Ah, hallelujah. Even now in the spirit, God, I see walls being torn down off the mind. And I thank you right now, God, for transforming their minds, God. I thank you right now, God, that they came to this altar one way, but they're leaving a different way, God, because of their yes, Lord. I give you thanks and I give you praise that right now you are confirming for them, God, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are confirming for them that the word that you have spoken Spoken over their lives is true. It is so. Every promise is amen. Hallelujah. I thank you for breakthrough now, God. I thank you for healing now, God. I thank you for deliverance now, God. I thank you for power now, God. I thank you for restoration now, God. I thank you right now that from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, your spirit has them, God. And I thank you that they're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, their Lord. I thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper in the name of Jesus. I thank you right now. We give you praise that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And we rejoice with the angels because, Lord, you are worthy. Because, Lord, you are good. Because, Lord, you are faithful. Because, Lord, you are mighty. Because, Lord, you are strong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. name we pray that all of God's children say amen say amen say amen in the name of Jesus 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 yes Lord 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 Every time someone surrenders and yields their life because it says the devil lost again. The devil lost again. The devil lost again. Is there anybody here that can give God praise that God is victorious again? 
Yeah!